Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Growing more with less is the mantra of Nebraska's corn farmers, and they're using incredible technology to do it. Soil moisture monitors let them know when their crop needs water and how much. GPS systems eliminate overlaps in the field, saving fuel and money. New hybrids reduce the use of pesticides and increase yields. When you're talking new technology and innovation, Nebraska corn farmers are all ears. Nebraska's family corn farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Darren Newsom looks at corn and soybean prices. We show you how the USDA determines its estimates for crop yields and production. Tamara Jackson Zims describes the spread of southern rust in Nebraska. And Al Dutcher gives his weekly weather forecast. DTN's Darren Newsom is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. Ahead of the agency's monthly crop report, the USDA's latest ratings show U.S. corn maintained the percentage of the crop in good to excellent categories. 76% is listed in the best two groups. That's six points above the rating this time in 2015. In soybeans, the crop improved from a week ago. 72% is now good to excellent, a point better than the previous week, and nine points ahead of this point last year. We talked with Darren Wednesday afternoon at DTN's offices in Omaha and began by asking for his thoughts about current crop conditions across the country. You know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I know what NASA's weekly reports are saying every week, and, you know, the latest ones we saw were that corn ratings were actually above 2014 and, you know, you know almost the equivalent of what we saw back in 2004. Uh, so we're starting to talk about some very large numbers. Now, the problem is those numbers usually aren't accurate and they aren't a very good sign as to what yield might actually turn out to be later on. Uh, but right now, crop conditions themselves, the crop condition ratings themselves are pretty high, pointing to the fact that again, at least in corn, it looks like you know yield is maybe better than what's being projected at this point. Do you think there will be adjustments in the August crop report next Friday? Yeah, you know, it's a great question because historic, you know, this isn't where USDA is actually going to look at NASA's numbers and use them as any sort of base for the decision they make. This is supposedly the first survey-based uh, set of numbers that they're going to release. And so that being the case, as of the end of July, I think it's possible that we could see USDA increase its yield numbers a little bit. And if they increase their yield, obviously production is going to go up as well. Will it be as high as some of the talk right now? You know, it seems like everybody's falling in line, falling in love with that 175 bushel per acre number. I think that's a little too high. I don't think USDA is going up there yet. And I don't think we're really going to know. In fact, I know we're not really going to know until the combines actually start rolling. Maybe that's the question. Do you sense the trade is leaning significantly higher? Well, you know, we've, we've pushed corn down. We've seen December corn go to a new low of 329 this week. Uh, the major low on its monthly charts down, you know, for, for the market itself is down 318 and a quarter. So, so we're within striking distance of that. So it would seem to be saying that, you know, there's at least a segment of the market that believes we're going to see much larger numbers when all said and done. Um, I don't know yet. I think we're going to have we're going to have to see how the fund money, how the investment money starts to play out. If we start to see some commercial buying coming back into this market, that would tell us that, you know, in the end maybe those those huge yields just aren't there and that there was actually some some weather damage done in july obviously two different questions but are we out of the woods for weather concerns in corn and soybeans as far as corn goes it certainly seems like it uh you know it's going to be what it's going to be now we, we did see we saw a little bit of everything in july where we saw some very hot temperatures uh, but we continued to see some intermittent rain mixed in so you know the idea is again crop conditions are going to come in good as long as the crop stays green when it starts to turn brown because it's maturing the crop condition numbers are going to come down uh, but as far as the weather goes it looks like corn is you know, made for better or for worse. And it's not going to change all that much. It just has to, to finish uh, finish maturing now. Soybeans, I think, 
are still up for grabs at least a little bit. Here in early August, we've seen some pretty good conditions for the soybeans. Um, and by what forecasts are saying right now, it looks like that's going to continue you know, for much of this month. Has the slide in corn and soybean markets been driven solely by weather? Uh, it's been due in large part to weather, yes. Uh, but it's not fundamentally driven. That's the thing. This isn't a supply and demand issue at this point. This is, a, this is an investment issue. Investment traders are bailing out of this market. They're selling their long positions. They're whittling them back. Uh, you know, in this Friday's CFTC commi commitment to traders report, it's very possible that we see uh, the corn go near par. In fact, you know, maybe they, they have almost an even amount of contracts bought and sold. So I think it's been more of an investment play than something based strictly on fundamentals because the future spreads haven't changed all that much. Uh, and particularly in soybeans where the long-term outlook still looks to be bullish as global demand continues to outpace global supplies. Globally, what do you expect for South American production in their next growing season coming up? I think it's going to be a tough decision uh, because, you know, price-wise, at least earlier this summer, uh, soybeans were just pulling away from corn. And they were saying, you know, we need to plant more soybeans, but Brazil's almost out of corn. So they're going to have to find some more corn acres or find some way of, of rebuilding their stocks. So I think it's a bit of a toss up in Brazil from what I'm hearing right now. Most likely we're going to see a few more soybean acres. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see them up their production soybeans because that's where global demand is the strongest. Global corn demand seems to be waning a little bit. I think it's going to pull in more acres for soybeans. Stepping aside from corn and beans and talking about crude oil, mm -hmm. can you explain where the slide has come from there and where you think the prices might go? Well, it's like everything else. We got too much of it. Uh, you know, we've got we've got grain supplies too large. Crude oil supplies are too large, and investors had bet on the idea that supplies were going to start to come down, demand was going to pick up. It didn't happen. So now we've got future spreads at incredibly wide levels. Uh, we've got investment money again just pouring out of the crude oil market, but it's coming down to some support. You know, everybody was getting all excited uh, when it moved back below 40. It wasn't that big a deal. You could see it coming from months away. Uh, but now we're getting down to that $38, $39 range, and it looks like that's where it's probably going to want to hold. Is there any seasonal reason for it to move higher after this? No, not really. But we could start to see some money come back in. A lot of it's going to have to do with what, uh, what happens in the dollar. Some of those answers are going to start to, to form uh, here this again this Friday when the July jobs data is released. That's going to give us an idea of when the Federal Reserve might actually move on interest rates next. That crop report could be a wild card, but to close out with your thoughts on where corn and soybeans might go here over the next week or two. Um, anywhere between zero and maybe five dollars in corn. <laughs> um, soybeans, similar. There, there's no way of telling. Uh, again, we are so close to the lows. Soybeans are actually testing support at around 930. Again, so, uh, corn is, is near its long-term low uh, of, of 318. If these areas don't hold, and if production is expected to increase, say, above 15 billion bushels in corn and well above what's being projected right now in soybeans, there's a lot of downside yet in these markets, just from, a, just from an oversupply situation. The structure of the markets don't look like that's going to happen, so we could be building a base of support in here. Certainly could change uh, with this next report because that's when uh, investment traders get the most active. Next week, University of Missouri Extension economist Ron Plain will look at hog markets and Oklahoma State Extension Livestock Marketing Specialist Daryl Peel will discuss cattle prices. On August 12th, the USDA will release its monthly crop report. For the first time this season, those numbers will include state-level production estimates made from both producer-based responses and actual field inspections. The farmers' guesses on their operations are called agricultural yield surveys. But in the 10 largest corn-producing states, accountable for nearly 83 percent of production in 2015, enumerators will sample hundreds of plots for the agency's objective yield survey. That process, which you're about to see, began this week. Nebraska's National Agricultural Statistics Service recently demonstrated for us how their corn sampling procedure works. In Iowa, Kansas, South Dakota, Nebraska, and the rest of the top 10 growing states in the nation, enumerators are fanning out this week to get a better look at the U.S. corn crop. 
While the U.S. Department of Agriculture is attempting to sample more than 20,000 corn farmers for its agricultural yield survey in August, the agency will aim to use 1,920 samples from cornfields across the country for its objective yield survey. Together, those results will form the USDA's projections for yield and production in its August crop report. Patrick Boyle is the deputy director for the USDA NAS Northern Plains region. The objective yield survey and the ag yield survey are used in combination because their strengths uh, play off of each other's weaknesses. Uh, the ag yield survey, uh, we can draw far more samples because the cost of collecting the data is relatively inexpensive compared to the objective yield survey. Although calling growers or sending them surveys through the mail for its ag yield survey is cheaper, the USDA says the narrow collection time from July 28th to about August 5th for this report can make things challenging. And it's subjective. The farmer is taking his or her best guess as to what a field will look like at harvest. NAS statistician David BR says that's the benefit of the objective yield survey. The objective side of things, you know, this is we're actually going out, taking hard plant counts and stock counts and getting a solid number. Um, we look at it, it's not just asking somebody, well, what do you think it is going to be when, you know, this part of the field looks good, but the other half of the field doesn't look good. This way we can say this is what it looks like. This is hard numbers for the field. This is how the objective yield survey works. The USDA randomly selects a cornfield from its June area survey. That field will contain two randomly generated sample areas and specific instructions directing where the enumerator is supposed to go. For example, uh, enumerator may be asked to uh, start at a, at a beginning point and then walk 150 paces uh, down the field and then 119 rows into the field and that's where they'll set up their first plot. Franklin Roby is a supervisor with the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. He and 11 other enumerators are covering 24 counties in southeast Nebraska. At the end of the last pace, then we take a, a yardstick and drop it down and then that's where we've uh, put a, uh, our tape measure and we measure out five feet buffer area and then we go measure out the end of the plot, uh, which would be 20 foot. So we have a 15 foot section. Within that 15 foot section, enumerators will work with plants in two rows. They'll mark the location because they'll return to that exact same plot for the next month's reports. The enumerators forms will direct them to first measure the distance between the two rows. Then they'll measure the distance between the first row and the fifth row. After logging the distance, they'll husk five ears to determine the maturity of the sample. This one is pretty much in the milk stage. Each maturity level carries a coded number. The sum of the five ears will designate what the enumerator does next. If it's uh, between the scores of between 13 and 22, then we complete the questions five through 12. In this case, a sum of 20 tells the enumerator to measure the kernel row, use calipers to determine the ear's diameter, and weigh the ears. At a number over 22, indicating a plant near maturity, the enumerator will send ears into a lab for more detailed analysis. They'll then count the number of stalks, the number of stalks with ears or silked ear shoots, the number of total ears in silked ear shoots, and the number of ears with evidence of kernel formation. Due to weather's impact on corn in various growth stages across the country, those numbers could change in future inspections. Each year, you know, a lot of it's weather dependent, uh, going through pollination, if there's a heat wave that comes through at that time, um, if there's stress on the plants, um, if ears will fill out completely or not. Roby says sampling both plots or units of a field will take a couple of hours to complete. At the end, he'll have one of Nebraska's 260 objective yield samples for the August crop report. But enumerators don't determine or even know the field's yield estimate when they finish. The numbers they entered on their form are plugged into a formula based on the plant's measurable characteristics and the historic relationship of what a plant with those characteristics would produce. Based on previous data that we have in the past, we can use that for modeling to come up with uh, an expected yield. It's possible an enumerator may be sampling the very worst area of a field, 
But it's also possible that an inspector in Wisconsin or Ohio or Illinois may be sampling the absolute best part of a field. The objective yield survey samples together are intended to paint an accurate picture of crop conditions across the country. Having access to accurate data, unbiased data, is critical to, uh, to a free market. Uh, NAS data, uh, while it may not be perfect, it is the best data out there. There is no agenda behind it. Um, we are there to level the playing field for farmers and ranchers across the country. For the first time this year, NAS is also using iPads for their entry forms. Because of the tight turnaround between data collection and the submission deadline, Boyle says the agency is hoping enumerators can send results directly from the field rather than bringing them back to the office and mailing them to the USDA. We should note the USDA also uses objective yield surveys in winter wheat, soybeans, fall potatoes, and upland cotton. A nationwide law will preempt Vermont's mandatory GMO labeling law, which took effect July 1st. President Barack Obama signed legislation instructing how food companies must disclose the presence of GMOs in their products. Those avenues include using a scannable QR code on packaging. The USDA will be in charge of rolling out the new standards. Nebraska Extension entomologist Tom Hunt said soybean aphids were found in several fields in northeast Nebraska towards the end of July. Tom said hot weather helped keep numbers lower, but populations can increase quickly. Nebraska Extension entomologist Bob Wright says it's important to remember the economic threshold for damage before deciding to treat for aphids. We're just starting to see the initial uh, colonization in soybean fields, particularly in northeast Nebraska where we have more aphids, so it's not, nothing to panic now, but get out and start checking your fields for soybean aphids. They don't like hot weather. If we have temperatures in the 90, as, as we're forecast to in the future, that will slow their reproduction. If it stays in the 80s, that's more favorable for their reproduction. And if we have favorable temperatures, they can reproduce relatively quickly. The threshold for soybean aphids on reproductive stage soybeans is 250 aphids per plant. and. Uh, we want to use that threshold because there's a lot of natural enemies that are out there that help us control soybean aphids. Even if we have 100 aphids per plant, the natural enemies may be able to keep it below the threshold. And if we spray early, we're just going to kill off the natural enemies and allow the soybean aphids to reproduce faster. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to more information about soybean aphids from Nebraska Extension. The August Nebraska Farmer says for father and son Dan and Ben Rice with Prairie Land Dairy near Firth, cow health starts with soil health. For the rices, this includes applying manure from the dairy onto silage acres as well as mixing up the crop rotation with cover crops to put organic matter back into the system. In 2000, they started composting solids from manure and food waste to apply on crop ground to provide a better environment for the soil microbe population. To learn more about their strategy, you can check out the August Nebraska Farmer. Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson Zim says several Nebraska counties have confirmed at least one case of southern rust. Tamara says cornfields in parts of the state are also experiencing other issues such as gray leaf spot and physoderma brown spot. To learn more about scouting and treatment recommendations for each, we talked with Tamara Tuesday afternoon near Columbus, Nebraska. Well, we've confirmed southern rust in more than 10 counties in the eastern half of the state so far. And I want to make sure people understand that counties where we've confirmed it, it doesn't mean the whole county has the disease, nor where counties have not had it confirmed, does that not mean that it's there? And so it's important that people are watching for it and paying special attention to fields that might be vulnerable to damage. Tell me about the timing of its appearance this year in the state. Well, it, having it diagnosed as early as the last week of July like it was is, is important, but it mainly is important relative to the stage of the crop and where corn is at. And so that will give us an indication of the potential for yield loss. I'm mainly concerned about fields that have may, maybe were very late planted or replanted that might be earlier in their development and have greater yield loss because of it if it develops there. What weather conditions would be favorable for its spread? These warm, humid conditions are perfect 
for that particular fungus and especially uh, temperatures that may linger in the 80s, whether that's in the daytime or the nighttime, overcast conditions and very humid conditions, whether uh, you know we feel that way or not, it's hu more humid in that canopy and, and that's important for us to remember too. What are the defining characteristics of southern rust and then the other common rust? Well, southern rust has more of a, a yellowish or a, a tan spore. And so uh, it may look orange too. And so uh, that gives it a little bit different appearance than common rust that's more of a brick round, brown to, to a red color. But unless they're side by side, color might be a little unreliable. And so I would look to see where the spores are produced and how large those pustules are. Southern rust mainly gonna be on the top leaf surface. They'll rub off with your fingers. And on the bottom of the leaf, uh, you could see a few southern rust pustules eventually, but common rust is mainly able to sporulate there. What are the differences in how those two affect the plant in terms of whether or not you need to treat for them? Well, southern rust is a much more aggressive pathogen, and so it can reproduce quickly, and we have much less resistance in our commercially available uh, dent corn hybrids for southern rust. Whereas in common rust, we have some natural resistance in most of our hybrids, and we tend to not worry too much about common rust, and that's why it's important for us to tell them apart. What about the treatment for southern rust? Well, our foliar fungicides do a very good job controlling southern rust. It impacts the severity of the disease and also reduces the chance of lodging and standability problems later on at harvest. And so they'll have to weigh that with the stage of their crop and how much southern rust is beginning to develop and monitor that closely in their fields. We'll switch gears. Let's talk about gray leaf spot. How prevalent is it? Well, we've begun to see gray leaf spot now for two or three weeks in, se in several parts of the state. Now, that's usually a very common disease for us, and it's important that people look specifically for their, uh, the very characteristic rectangular gray lesions starting in the lower canopy. The margins of those lesions are smooth and straight, and that's in contrast to a lot of other diseases. Do you need to manage it? That will depend on hybrid susceptibility and some other high risk factors like continuous corn or minimum till. And so I would watch to see how high on the plant that disease is moving and how much leaf area you've got. And as it approaches the ear leaf, just know that you've probably got leaves affected one or two above that. All right, physoderma. Well, physoderma is uh, it, not usually a problem. You know, in, in Iowa, we've seen some uh, examples where it's caused some stalk breaking and uh, uh, weakening around the nodes. And so on, on the leaves, you'll notice physoderma can develop either in bands or it can cover entire leaves, but those lesions look different depending on whether they're on the blade or in the, in the midrib and, and the spores don't rub off. And so it, uh, it can be misleading because they are yellow and it might confuse people with southern rust. Treatment necessary? Not, not really. And to close out with Goss's wilt and northern corn leaf blight, what's the update on those two? Well, we haven't seen much Goss's wilt this year, and that might be maybe because we've had less hail widespread in the state. That one's bacterial, of course. Northern corn leaf blight, also fungal, like gray leaf spot. I've seen less of that this year, but that might be because it's favored by the cool, damp conditions. And now that we're warmer, we might see less of it overall. Now, with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we begin for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main forecast, kind of an update of this last week and what we have seen is that same repeat pattern. We've cooled down on the weekend only to see our temperature skyrocket as we move to the middle of the week. Then to see an overall cool down, just as we're going to see this weekend as another frontal boundary moves across the northern plains and pushes the ridge to our south. So in this last week, the big winners for precipitation were portions of north central central Nebraska and portions of east central Nebraska. The farther, of course, you got closer to the Kansas Nebraska border, the less we had in precipitation. And unfortunately, it's starting to be reflected in the latest drought monitor. And if we go to the latest drought monitor, what we are going to see is that we are seeing an expansion of the normally dry conditions across the southern portion of the state and an expansion in south central Nebraska of moderate drought conditions. There was some debate by the monitor authors about increasing a small area to severe drought, but it was so small they didn't think it could fit on a national scale. So we do have some rather 
interesting dry patterns developing south central Nebraska. There's good news in the forecast if it does hold, but further to the west, one of the things that we have seen was some scattered precipitation, isolated thunderstorms on a regular basis throughout the panhandle, but authors didn't feel sufficiently uh, comfortable with reducing the drought in the northern panhandle simply due to the latest uh, temperatures that we've been seeing out there. Consistently uh, during these hot spells, we've been seeing temperatures in the upper 90s to the mid 100 degree range, and so the ET values in this region have been excessively high, and the concern with the fire danger has not been undone. So we're going to need to see a little bit more precipitation before the authors feel comfortable enough to reduce that precipitation. Now, we showed you a couple weeks ago what the latest precipitation for forecasts were by CPC for the month of August. Those have been updated. The, the first one comes out in the middle of the month and then they update August forecast at the end of the month. And here is what we're seeing. Instead of that northwest to southwest flow, they're more showing a, a west to east flow, meaning that they're expecting the periphery of the upper ridge when these troughs come across to now lie to our south and Nebraska would be around the periphery of that ridge. And indeed, that's what our forecast for this week is looking like. So as we look today, what we are noticing is once again, we have this trough in the west and we also have it basically the ever upper edge of that ridge sitting right across south central Nebraska. And what we are noticing is the monsoonal flow is moving around this ridge. And so right now Nebraska is targeted this weekend to be on the periphery of that ridge. The good news is right now the quantitative precipitation forecasts are shooting for southern Nebraska, basically at I-80 corridor southward as a primary beneficiary of this latest round of precipitation that's going to break out for these next couple days. In fact, if we look at the seven day forecast in this region, looking at over two inches, this is the best forecast that we've seen for precipitation in southern Nebraska in an extended forecast for basically the last month. So hopefully it will come to fruition. If it doesn't, the big concern, of course, is the heat that we've been dealing with during the middle of the week continue to basically bring this crop uh, down. And as we go into Sunday, you see, once again, that ridge is flat. Here comes another piece of energy, so we expect another round of, of precipitation that will move through southern Nebraska. Unfortunately, northern Nebraska looks to be well, well to the north of this primary area, and we don't expect a lot of precipitation. As we go into Monday, one more round of precipitation rolls through before we start to see the ridging pattern start to develop, and here comes the ridge, so the heat returns in earnest as we get into the midweek period. This is the pattern we've been going on and off now for the last five to six weeks. As we go into Wednesday, this ridge is solidly in place. We'll see some very warm temperatures back into the low to mid 90s with high dew point temperatures. You notice the trough in the Pacific Northwest starts to make its way toward our region. So as we get to Thursday, it's going to start pushing the heat toward the east and we increase the monsoon flow from the southwest. That should start making its way into our region as we get into next weekend. So here we are on Friday. Here comes the monsoonal flow and we start to see a cool down. So we'll rent, wash and repeat. 8 to 14 day forecast takes the heat to our east. That's from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. And in terms of precipitation, they do indicate robust precipitation in the upper Midwest. I think they're underplaying the dryness here. So we'll see with the monsoon flow. I expect all this area will see above normal precipitation. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information about corn and soybean markets, USDA NAS crop estimates, and southern rust. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next week, Ron Plain will analyze hog markets, and Daryl Peel will look at cattle markets. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.